Our struggle is not against concrete corrupted individuals, but against those in power in general, against their authority, against the global order and the ideological mystification which sustains it. That's what Paul really meant. <laughs> so what I want to do based on this is just to go on practicing the old half-forgotten art of the critique of ideology. When then are we in ideology? When we read an ideological proclamation, whichever statement, American patriotism, socialism, democracy, we are well aware that this is not how real people experienced it. In order to pass from abstract propositions to people's real lives, we had to add to the abstract propositions the unfathomable density of a life world context. And I claim ideology are not abstract propositions in themselves, freedom, democracy, whatever. Ideology is this very density of a symbolic network, which I use the term here in the Kantian sense, schematizes these abstract propositions in the sense of renders them livable, provides the background. <coughs> So for the way we concretely understand them. Take military ideology. It becomes livable. Officially, it's discipline, struggle for your country, and so on. But again, it becomes livable only against the background of the obscene, unwritten rules and rituals, marching chants, fragging, sexual innuendos, in which it is embedded. For me, when I was young, I served in my country, ex-Yugoslavia, the army. And this was, for me, almost the moment of formation of my insights, where, to be frank, I'm a kind of a, what you call, control freak, freak obsessional neurotic, almost a fascist character. I like order efficiency. So quite openly, I was glad to go to the army. But then came the disappointment of my life. Army is not that. Nothing functioned. It was all one big obscenity, improvisation, and so on and so on. And it took me some time to get it that this was not any kind of subversive resistance. That's how power functions. What appears to be a secret resistance to power, all the obscenities, dirty clothes, and so on and so on, is the way power is sustained. Which is why, my first thesis, if there is an ideological experience at its purest, it is at the moment when we adopt the attitude of wise ironic distance and laugh at the follies we are ready to believe. You know, when you say, no bullshit, cut the crap, let's go to how things really are. Be careful. When someone uses that language, it means you will get ideology at its purest. <laughs> I can even give you an example. You know, popular philosopher Harry Frankfurt, who wrote the book uh, on bullshit. You remember, it was a mega bestseller, short essay. Uh, I immediately was suspicious, and my suspicion was well justified, because I read an interview with Frankfurt, probably he didn't dare to do this here, about two years ago, in a German philosophical journal, where they asked him, okay, but give me an example, do you have an example of today in the United States of a politician who is not bullshitting? He said, John McCain. <laughs> Here is the we are. So again, uh, what is ideology? During a public debate that I had with uh, a person whom I don't especially like, Bernard Henri Levy, the French new philosopher, at New York Public Library, something interesting happened. Uh, first, he made a pathetic case for liberal tolerance, something like would you not like to live in a society where you can make fun of the predominant religion without the fear of being killed for it, where women are free to dress the way they like and choose the partner as a partner, the men they love, and so on and so on. And I made, I must say, a similar pathetic case for communism <laughs> with a growing food crisis, ecological crisis, and so on and so on. Is there not a need to find a new way of collective action which radically differs from market as well as from state administration. The irony was that when we both stated our case in these abstract terms, we both couldn't but agree with each other. I said, what should I say? No, I want women to be oppressed and uh, <laughs> submitted to 
Because of course I want that. And even if he said, oh, if this is communism, then I'm a communist, and so on. This means that we were in ideology. You got it? Because we obliterated this tense background, as it were background noise, which, on account of which, when you say today things like he said, it's not just what you get. It's the whole set of unwritten rules which provide a very specific, concrete meaning of what you are saying. I don't want to lose your time here, but I've elaborated this in some of my last books, I think especially in uh, violence. This is a phenomenon, namely, which immensely fascinates me. How, what a complex phenomenon social rules, norms are. Why? Rules, norms are not only simply norms which tell you how to act for reasons which can be nicely developed in psychoanalytic theory, norms are never consistent. Whenever you want to become part of a certain collective, you discover that there are some written or unwritten, whatever rules regulating the interaction of people who are in. But then you soon discover something else, that it's not only explicit rules which matter. What matters even more are a kind of a meta uh, 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 higher level rules, rules which tell you how to deal with the explicit rules. For example, often things are officially prohibited, but the true message between the lines is do it if you are not an idiot. <laughs> you know, like in sexuality, in some countries, even at the level of criminal. For example, it, it can be nicely demonstrated that the entire Soviet Union functioned only through smuggling to black market and so on, so the official rules had to be violated. And if you follow the explicit rules, you were simply an idiot. You didn't get it. <coughs> uh, but a much more interesting example is the opposite one. It's not that the law or the rules prohibit something, but between the lines the message is do it. It's when you are allowed, solicited even, to do something on condition that you don't really do it. You know, like you are given a free choice on condition that you make the right choice, as it were. And this is another fascinating topic. I think this is the fundamental, maybe zero level, ideological mechanism to give you a choice on condition that, uh, that uh, the choice is free. In one of my early books, so I hope you don't know the example. I quote an example precisely from the time when I was in the Yugoslav army, which is very simple, even stupid, but it's wonderful how purely clinical this example is. I don't know how it is in your army, but in probably in most armies it is as it was in Yugoslav army where I served, where after the, the beginning, the first drill, two, three weeks, you swear the oath. You know, it's the solemn procedure, all you soldiers are gathered, and then you do the usual bullshit. I am ready to do everything up to time for my country, and so on and so on. <laughs> then after all of us pronouncing these words in public, each of us then had to sign the oath. And then a friend of mine, I wouldn't dare to do it, but he did it. He was one of my heroes. Uh, when it came to signing the oath, he said, no, I will not sign the oath. Then the officer asked him, tell him, but are you crazy? You will be arrested. You must sign it. The guy said, wait a minute. Give me a clear answer. Am I obliged? Are you ordering me to sign it or not? And you know, it was a magic moment where a crack in ideological edifice appeared. Because the, so the, the officer told him, no, are you crazy? This is an oath. This is your free act. Then the guy said, no, but if it's a free act, I will not do it. Then he just, it's an order and I will do it. And then a miracle happened. I have a photocopy of this. Uh, the officer wrote him on a piece of paper an order to freely sign. <laughs> this, is, this is how it functions. Okay, it's never as simple as that. I'm well aware of it. But what I'm saying is that if you want to understand and ideology. You know, always look at these ambiguities. It's never what it says, it's how you relate to what it says. Where can you feel this gap at its purest? Precisely in what 